pantry milks, like condensed milk, milk powder, and even evaporated milk are the foundation of some of my favorite desserts. A kitchen cupboard, well stocked with these pantry milks, enables you to bake a sweet treat at a moment's notice. Here today is dairy expert Holly Granger to educate us about these versatile shelf-stable milks. Then I'm going to incorporate a variety of pantry milks into two heavenly desserts. First, a passion fruit meringue pie and a quattro leches cake. Plus, chef Alex Granicelli is here with a delicious condensed milk pound cake. All today on Martha Bakes. Pantry milks are something that we often overlook, but should be a staple in everyone's pantry. And today I have Holly Granger as our visitor. She's a dairy ambassador and nutritionist. And she's here to teach us about the versatility of these pantry milks in the kitchen. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, Martha. I'm excited to be here. How are each of these milks made? So we have condensed milk here, evaporated milk, low-fat evaporated. Uh, milk powder and this is shelf, shelf stable. Shelf stable. That's it, what you get in Europe all the time. Yes. Well, and that's what always makes people scratch yeah. their head because in America we're so used to fresh, getting fresh, fresh milk. milk in you know in the refrigerated yeah. section. But that's what's so unique about these milks is that they're reliable and they're made from real dairy milk. So they all start in the same way. Sweet condensed milk and evaporated milk, I like to think of them like they're cousins. So in the same way that you might reduce a sauce on the stovetop, these are reduced or evaporated or condensed with a gentle heating process until 60% of the liquid is gone. The water. Of the water, yes. yes. And so okay. that's what gives it that nice creamy texture. And you can see it has just a little bit of color and that's from the heating the of cooking. the milk, yes. The evaporated has no sugar? That's correct. Okay, and so, this has how much sugar, a lot? A lot, yes, it's about <laughs> it's about 60% milk to 40% sugar. Oh wow. But that's what okay. makes it so delicious. So it's heated gently, but it must have the, at the boiling point. Because, yeah, it gets to yes. the boiling point because that's what helps. You start Evaporate. with real milk that's then heated down, the liquid is evaporated, and then that's where evaporated milk stops. Yeah. And, and then this is low fat, so same thing, but just low fat milk. Yes. Now make. powdered milk. So powdered milk, the same thing happens. The liquid is evaporated, but then it's dried and heated. And so that helps to make it shelf stable. And you can keep it in your pantry for a Have all the nutrients year. remained in this powdered milk? A large portion, some of the B vitamins and some of the ones that are a little bit more heat sensitive are gone, but you still get that high quality protein and calcium in the milk powder. Mm -hmm. And what's great about milk powder is Certainly you can add it to breads to add to the texture and you can add water to that and reconstitute it yeah. and it's just like drinking a glass of milk. So you have your vitamin D, you have your calcium and yeah. protein, you're getting a lot of that great nutrition. And so when, as a dietitian, I remember it, even when I was in school and it was like, how do you bulk up the calories? The answer was always add non-fat dry milk powder. Okay. So if you're making okay. a smoothie, it's a great way to be able to supplement, to add even more nutrition. And then this is shelf stable milk. So how is that processed? So this is made with ultra high temperature. You, you might see UHT and it's ultra pasteurized. So in the same way that milk is pasteurized to kill the bacteria, mm -hmm. this is just pasteurized at a quicker time at a higher temperature. So ultra pasture. Yes, so it kills everything. And you can buy the shelf stable milk, it will stay on the shelf and be good for about three months. So what's missing from that that's in fresh milk? You are losing a little bit of those B vitamins because of the heat, but it's heat flashed so quickly that it, not too much of the nutrition is destroyed. Oh, okay. And you do get a little bit of a sweeter flavor just because it's heated, just like the other ones. And so what's the history? Why did we do that in the first place? Well, what's so interesting in the 1800s, this was a way that people were able to preserve milk because back then we didn't have refrigeration. Refrigeration <laughs> didn't come in until the 1900s. And unless you had the cow tethered in the backyard, exactly, you'd have to preserve it some way. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So boiling it down and making this type of product was a great way to be able to let people have the nutrition and be able to have milk. What's also interesting is that the sweetened condensed milk was used to serve the troops during the war because they were able to get the nutrition from milk in a form that also was a treat. So is there any problem just storing that in the fridge? Does it have a fridge life? It does. So yeah. each of these are a little bit different. You can store sweet and condensed milk in the pantry for up to two years. Of course, always check right. the best by date. Right. Once it's opened, it stays in an airtight container. It will stay good for about five to seven days. Same with evaporated milk. Evaporated milk has a little shorter life. It's about a year in the pantry. 
in about four to five days once it's been open, store it in the refrigerator. Milk powder, same thing. You can store this in your pantry for up to two years. But once in the freezer, you could put it for a long time. Yes, you know. and, and that's the thing that's so nice about it. Once it's opened, it will last about three months. And then shelf-stable milk will last on the shelf up to three months. Once you've opened it, same type of thing as regular milk, about seven to 10 days in the refrigerator. Okay. Well, thank you, Holly. This, uh, you're a font of information. And, I appreciate it. Uh, and I look forward to using all of these different milks in our recipes. Thank you, Martha. It was exciting to be here. It's hard to think of a dessert as simple to prepare and as complex in flavor as my recipe for passion fruit meringue pie. The crust is crisp and salty, the filling sweet, tart, and refreshing, and the top piled high with toasted meringue. The first thing to make is the crust. I'm using four ounces of saltine crackers. Pulp until they're pretty much finely ground up. Not completely, you want a little bit of texture. And then add half a cup, one stick of unsalted butter. Make sure the butter is at room temperature, which means soft like that. If you were making a pat brise, you know what, how the butter has to be icy cold. This is just the opposite. And a quarter cup of sugar. And that, by the way, is your crust. And you just pulse until you see that everything's pretty much combined. And I, I think that's enough. And then just put this mixture right into your pie plate. This is a nine inch pie plate. And with your rubber spatula, just press this down. If you find that this is a little sticky, which I'm finding, use the bottom of your metal measuring cup. This works pretty well to really flatten the crust. Press until firm and even thickness all the way around. So there, that's your crust. Now you can put this right into a preheated 350 degree oven and bake until the crust is golden brown. That takes about 18 to 20 minutes. Set your timer. In keeping with the simplicity of the entire recipe, the filling is very easy to make. Four egg yolks, one 14 ounce can of sweetened condensed milk, right out of the can. These cans are 14 ounces. Scrape it all out. And a half a cup of passion fruit puree. This comes in the refrigerated section of a fancy grocery store or you can find your own inside the passion fruit. Although you need to get a quarter of a cup, you might need two or three passion fruits depending on the ripeness. The more wrinkly and more gnarly looking a passion fruit is, the more juice it's going to have, the riper it is. And this, you would have to squeeze all that juice out of the seeds and press them through a strainer. So I suggest trying to find the prepared uh, passion fruit puree. So this is the passion fruit. Put that in. It's pungent, sweet, tart, delicious all at the same time. And I can eat like three or four of these fresh ones at a sitting. They're very addictive. And this is the filling. See how easy the citrus juice of the passion fruit reacts with the condensed milk, causing the mixture to thicken. And here's our crust, all nicely baked and cooled. Just pour this mixture right into the crust. After I took the crust out of the oven, I reduced the temperature to 325. And this is going to go right back into that oven and bake for about 15 to 17 minutes longer. So delicious. There. Wiggle it around a little, make sure it's nice and even. Set your timer. So here's our pie cooled out of the oven. Look how gorgeous. Now four egg whites into your mixer, fitted with a wire whisk. And you're going to beat these until they're just frothy. You can add a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. And what we're going to be making is a kind of a crunchy meringue. 
four egg yolks, and a whole cup of sugar. Three quarters of a cup of granulated sugar, and a quarter of a cup of medium coarse sanding sugar, which will give the meringue a little bit of a crunch. So this is gonna take about five to seven minutes. This is a French meringue. That's the easiest and most basic of all meringues because it's just beaten egg whites with sugar. You can add a little vanilla if you like, but this doesn't need it. And now, just for the last minute or so, add your sanding sugar. This will add a little sparkle to your meringue and that little crunch, which is so interesting there. Nice stiff peaks. Now spread this over your custard and swirl it whichever way you prefer. Big swirls, little swirls, casual swirls. You decide. I like it like this. This looks so gorgeous. So that's your meringue. It looks pretty. And finishing touch, of course, is a light browning. Don't overdo it. You don't want to have a burnt taste. You just want a golden brown color. Now that is a show-stopping dessert. Enjoy. You might have heard of the popular tres leches cake, but have you heard of a cuatro leches cake? I experimented by adding yet another pantry milk to make it even more rich and more delicious. And the process is uh, the same as a tres leches, but we're adding milk powder into our dry ingredients. So in a medium bowl, we want to sift one and a quarter cups of cake flour, quarter of a cup of milk powder. That's whole milk, which has been dehydrated. We have baking powder, one and a half teaspoons. And some salt, half a teaspoon. I use a kosher salt for most of my baking. And a half a cup of sugar. And I just sift all of these things together using a fine sieve. There, everything went through the strainer. And now in this bowl, the wet ingredients. Five large egg yolks, mix those up. Add your second milk. This is a half a cup of whole milk. And some safflower oil, third of a cup of safflower, which is a sort of scentless, pretty much tasteless oil. But instead of butter, a chiffon cake uses clear oil like this. And the scrapings of one vanilla bean. Numerous little seeds inside your vanilla bean, which grows on a vanilla orchid plant. All of a sudden, vanilla is becoming very expensive. Now in this mixer, we have six egg whites. Bring those to a froth. We have this nice casserole dish, uh, nine by 13, three inches deep, all buttered and ready to get the cake batter. To help stabilize the egg whites, a quarter of a teaspoon of cream of tartar and a half a cup of granulated sugar. And just beat until you have a shiny, glossy meringue. Now the wet ingredients can go right into the flour. Stir until most of the lumps are gone. And I think that's done. Oh yes. Glossy, smooth. Most of it comes off if you bang it off. And put a little bit of the egg whites into your batter. Look how fluffy. Oh, so nice. Just fold this in to lighten that batter. And add some more. This will give you such a beautiful airy cake. Mm, beautiful. And pour it in an even layer in your prepared pan. You can use round cake pans if you don't have a big square like this. And smooth it out. 
Your oven should be preheated at this point to 325 degrees and bake until the top of the cake springs back when you touch it. And that takes about 40 minutes for a cake this size. Yummy. So now here's where this cake gets its name, Cuatro Leches. Soak the cake. This cake just came out of the oven. It's nice and warm. One cup of whole milk. Now remember, we've already used the dry milk solids in the cake itself, in the batter. One 14 ounce can of sweetened condensed milk and one 12 ounce can of evaporated milk. So those are our cuatro leches, our four milks. So just stir those milks together. Now, with a wooden skewer, make lots of holes in the top of your cake. And go all the way down to the bottom with your skewer. Pierce the cake. This is going to help the cake absorb much of that milk that we're going to pour right over it. There. And now just gently pour over. And it's absorbing. The cake absorbs more if it's warm. And the milk is pretty much room temperature. Mm. And of course, this whole thing becomes pretty dense and pretty moist. So let the cake sit for about one hour until it's really room temperature, and then coat it with whipped cream sweetened with sugar. So now I'm just cutting up some peaches because I think the peaches are going to be delicious with this Quattro Leches cake. And here's what the cake looks like, cooled. Looks gorgeous. And now I'm just going to spoon whipped cream on top. This is two cups of heavy cream that is chilled and then whipped with a quarter of a cup of sugar. And just spread this evenly all over the top. So that's our fifth milk. But you can still call it cuatro leches. Cut this into squares. Put a few peaches on the plate and enjoy your cuatro leches. You're gonna be making this dessert again and again once your family tastes it. Enjoy. Chef and good friend Alex Gornicelli has come up with a clever twist on a traditional pound cake. And she adds one of my favorite pantry favorites, condensed milk. Thanks for joining me today, Alex. So nice to have you here. Anytime talking cake with you, I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> so did you just do this by accident because you didn't have real milk? Or is it something that you contemplated? No, I really contemplated it because I think the texture that condensed milk offers is uniquely great and the moistness that it yeah. brings. And it's nice to be able to literally, other than eggs and butter, just dig in your pantry make, and make this. Is yours a pound a pound a pound kind of cake? No, but you gain a pound <laughs> exactly. for every pound you eat. So I guess there is some symmetry. Okay. So we just start with two sticks of unsalted butter. And I add only a half a cup of sugar because this condensed milk is oh, just... This has so much sugar in it. Yeah. So we're going to start that process of creaming butter and sugar. The two sticks of softened butter. Get that going a little bit. And What's your I... butter of choice? Is it a French butter or is it an American butter? You know, recently I was reading that European butter, because the water content is so different, that American recipes are better suited for American butter. And why not keep it in the country? So mm. I'm about American. Okay, that's a, that's a good point, because I've been trying different butters, and sometimes my pot brise even doesn't work as well with European butter. And you think I'm doing something more elevated. It yeah, should but yield it, a better result. But it doesn't all the time. So I, I think you're right. Keep I it American. Yeah. Okay, so while the butter and sugar are creaming together, I just like to mix together the dry ingredients. So one and a third cups of flour. One and a third, okay. Three quarters of a teaspoon of uh, baking powder. I love being your Sue Baker. You, you're never a Sue. You're I'm your Sue, Sue believe me. And then I use a teaspoon of coarse salt and I, I, I break it up a little with my hands oh, as so I drop it in. Oh, so you're gonna get little crunchies in it. I also like when the flavors, it varies a little bit from bite to bite in a cake. I think that makes it more exciting. I agree. So there are the dry. And then I crack three eggs into a bowl and drop in two teaspoons vanilla. Very simple. So I'm gonna add the eggs first, just one by one. 
So I've added all three eggs and the vanilla, and now I'm gonna just add the condensed milk right in, and that really just smooths this texture right out. Three quarters of a cup. I love baking. It's very therapeutic for a savory chef, you know? It's a change of pace. Time that up. So what other pantry milks do you keep in your pantry? So I really love powdered milk. Oh, you do? And what I like to do with it is foam and brown some butter and drop powdered milk into it. And the milk powder kind of crisps a little bit, almost like fine breadcrumbs. Oh. And they really take on the flavor and, and of the brown butter. What do you use that for? Pop that right on top of fish. I oh. mean, if you think about fresh fish preparations where they, French ones, where they roll it in a thin layer of brioche and brown it, it sort of produces mm. a similar effect. Oh, that's interesting. And it's a more interesting way to use powdered milk than your classic idea. And now I'll literally drop this in. So this is the baking powder. The salt, the coarse salt, and the flour. Oh, so you just put the whole thing in? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. And just gently, as my mom says, the classic, draw a C in your batter just to fold. Mixing as little as I So need. I bet a lot of our instructions come from your mother. They do. And they come from watching you. Oh. <laughs> so this is it. Here's the batter. So beautiful. I did want to mention, too, that the condensed milk weighs down the batter because it's so intense. So you definitely don't want to skimp on creaming the butter and oh, sugar I see. together. That's why, okay. To get that real fluff factor, you definitely don't want to shortcut it. And the pan, which is a uh, ordinary loaf pan. Nine by five. Nine by five by three was well buttered. Oh, yes. And then I don't really do much. I think gravity will handle this. Okay. And we'll go into a 350 degree oven for about an hour. Okay. Set your timer. Martha putting my cake in the oven. I can retire. I cannot wait. <laughs> Thank you. So that's the leftover condensed milk. Yeah. Okay. The rest of the can comes out to a half a cup. To it, I add, I, I want brightness for this because the condensed milk is sweet. So again, I go to my pantry, get the classic red wine vinegar out, and I actually put a dash of that, about a teaspoon, right into the mm, condensed milk. That's interesting. So I have the rest of the can of condensed milk, just a dash of red wine vinegar, the zest of one oh, lime, okay. perfect, and then some lime juice. And I go right in there and just add the lime juice in there. and. It's a taste thing. I think you really want some brightness. And I think the vinegar actually brings the lime more to the forefront. And then I'm just gonna literally pour this right over the cake. Mm-hmm. Smells so good, the lime. Mm. I also associate condensed milk with key lime pie almost more than anything. I love those pies. So will that harden? It'll get a little bit firmer, yes, yes. As, it, as it sits, definitely. And then I just slice and go. And you can see that gloss from the condensed milk. It's so good. Thin or thick, I mean, I'm really sort of a... Thin, thin for me. That's thin, for thin you. Thin, for you. <laughs> and I want thin, thin. Well, that looks really tasty, and the texture of the cake is so beautiful. I mean, I'd love to take credit, but the condensed milk, it's sort of like an insurance policy against dryness, mm, I think. Really good. You've done it again. Thanks for this updated pound cake recipe. Of course. And thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. One thing I really struggle with in the kitchen is measuring goopy substances accurately. My little trick is dip my measuring spoons in cornstarch. You could do it with flour too. And when you're measuring something like corn syrup, which can never come out of the spoon, it just pops right out when you have this layer of cornstarch. And for example, maple syrup pops right out accurately. The final test, honey, guess what? Your buddy cornstarch does the trick.